Hi, my name is Ken Hughes and welcome back to another session on the psychology of understanding the captive post-COVID-19 consumer. Today I want to talk about the psychology of queuing. So everywhere in the retail experiences and the service experiences that we're seeing, no matter where you are in the world, the queue has become, I guess, part of your life. You might be queuing to get into supermarkets, you might be queuing to get into shopping malls, you might be queuing uh, for service experiences. And the, one of the main issues, I think, for the service provider, for the retailer, is to see your queue as a functional thing as opposed to what it is an opportunity to gain significant customer experience. It's so what I call QX, the Q experience. Let's look at how we can actually build in some positivity into the Q if we understand what's happening inside the consumer's mind. So let's look at kind of five or six things about the psychology of queuing. And the first one I wanna talk about is the need to occupy the consumer. So they're standing in a queue, they're bored, and there's some really interesting work happened in the 1950s. Up to that point, any kind of queue management psychology was to do with the efficiency of a queue, time management. And this was the first time in the 1950s that the psychologists turned their attention to what was happening inside the people's minds. And when you're waiting for something, when you're queuing, you're bored, uh, you've nothing to do, and the perceived waiting time is there for longer. So there's a wonderful study in the 1950s for the skyscraper business when they were building all these huge tall buildings in New York. Uh, people had to wait longer than they ever had before for an elevator because now you had you know, 20, 50, 100 floors as opposed to five. And the waiting time, the perceived waiting time for these tenants, for these customers of the skyscraper uh, was very, very high and they didn't like it. So what did they do? They, they installed mirrors in the lobbies of the foyers. And just by doing that, the perceived waiting time was much, much lower. Now the actual waiting time was exactly the same, but the perceived waiting time was lower because the consumer had something to do. They were preening themselves, they were looking in the mirror, they were using the mirrors to look at other people, and that's how the human mind works. If you occupy the mind, the perceived waiting time is lower. So that's the first thing. Look at your queue and see, can you occupy the consumers in the queue somehow? And the next thing that kind of means you, you can look at is to get them started. Getting the consumer started while they're in the queue, while they're there ready to consume your service or retail experience is very clever. Think about the last time a, a maitre d' welcomed you at a restaurant, showed you to the table, and said your server will be with you now any moment, and bustled off. Now the server or the kitchen may not even be ready for you as a customer, but you're started, you're sitting down, you've got the breadsticks, you're looking at the menu. Same thing in, in an airport, when someone hands you a menu as you queue outside of the re restaurant, you haven't, you're not even in yet to sit down, but you've got a menu in your hand. So you've got something to do, back to that first point, occupy, occupy the consumer, but you're getting started, you're looking at what you might choose. So getting the customer started is really, really important. I think if you take your eye off that, you're losing potential queue experience, positivity, what the consumers could be doing. If they're just standing in the queue, like little human robots, that's not a good thing. So the next one I wanna talk about then is the uncertainty, and there's kind of two things here, the uncertainty and keeping someone informed. So humans, we don't like uncertainty. We really, we kind of fill that vacuum quite fast. So if you give someone certainty about the shape of what's about to happen, then at least they have set expectations. Think about all the times that, uh, Ryanair, Ryanair are a great example. So they add 30 minutes to every journey time of their, of their journeys around Europe, the low cost airline, so that expectations are met. So even if you're 30 minutes late, you're on time. Uh, think about every pilot who always, uh, you know, if you're delayed, keeps you up for, informed, updated as to why, why, why. They want to tell you something every 10 or 15 minutes just to kind of, you know, to, to lower your anxiety. Um, and the same thing back to that elevator study. You know, elevators in the olden days didn't have that needle that showed you first floor, second floor, third floor. But the moment that went up there, consumers now can see that the elevator's on the sixth floor, it's on its way down to me, then your expectations are managed. So ask yourself, what are you doing to manage expectations in that queue? How are you keeping that uncertainty away from consumers? How are you keeping them informed? Are you telling them that it's going to be another 20 minutes to get in? Think about every theme park that you've ever visited. You know, there's large theme parks like Disney. They always have the sign, one hour from here, 30 minutes from here. As you're queuing for the rides, your expectations are being managed. They're trying to take that uncertainty away from you. So you need to do that to look at you know, increasing the queue experience. And the last two are about fairness and anxiety. So be fair. I mean, a queue in, in its essence is a fair system. First come, first served. Uh, and so trying to keep fairness is important. But back to that theme park example, every theme park in the world sells a priority pass, don't they? $100, $150, you can skip the queue, you can get on first. The NFL do it, you know, we have priority passes for airlines. So if you're a loyal customer, you get to skip the queue. Now you gotta start thinking about this. You know, if, you, if I queued for an hour to get into your store, it was a very long time. So should you maybe give me a coupon or a discount or a, a little voucher or something that I can skip the queue the next time I come so you can return and visit? 
What about those consumers, the 20% of consumers making up, making up 80% of your business? What about giving those priority passes and making sure that you lock those in during this crisis times? So think about how you can manage, and this is a hard one, you're gonna manage the fairness of the queue, but also use it as a positive thing for loyal customers to be able to bypass and get into the store faster. So have a think about that. And the last one is anxiety, managing customers' anxiety, and how you queue, so how do we queue? So for instance, there's, there's, the, there's the standard single queue, you might have four queues in a row, or you have a serpentine queue, which is all, we're all feeding into one queue, which of course is fairer. So most stores are look, look, have, have serpentine queues at the moment, but they look very long when you look at the store, you think, oh my God, there's, you know, there's so many people in that queue, I'm not gonna join it, I'll go to a competitor store. So think about maybe opening multiple queue points into the store. If I'm going into a DIY store and I want to buy some plants, some gardening equipment, why am I queuing up with everybody else who's buying plumbing equipment and building equipment? Why, aren't, why don't we have several queues for several areas of the store? So you're gonna have, really have to start thinking about what you can do with this queue. And it all comes back to what we call the halo effect. The halo effect is what we do to set up a positive experience. If, if the customer has an initial positive experience before they enter the retail space or the service experience, they will more likely to perceive everything that follows to be positive. So we have to make sure that the queue experience is a halo effect experience. Otherwise, we're setting up the whole initial interaction as quite a negative thing. And obviously they will find the negative things afterwards if we do that. So have a think about gamification, having a think about occupying the consumer uh, in the queue. Have a think about introducing stock checkers so that people can check if is the item even in the store that I'm about to queue in, queue for. Uh, think about queue runners. Is there a way that we can actually get people working the queue to go inside and get the stuff and come and bring it out? Look at digitization, booking systems, click and collect models. And basically the whole point of this, this blog and this video is to encourage you to use the queue as a customer experience, QX, as opposed to just something functional that sits there that we have to battle through to get into the store. Look at it as an opportunity to add value to the customer experience. I'm Ken Hughes. I'll see you next time.